Hi everyone. Over the last weeks, I've got several questions and comments all related to the cause of atherosclerosis. Most of the questions and comments were skeptical and doubting the causal effect of NDL cholesterol or lipoprotein A on atherosclerosis. So I decided to dedicate this episode to elaborate more on how modern science arrives at conclusions on the cause of chronic degenerative diseases like atherosclerosis. I'm Hussein Hashmat, Professor of Cardiology, and this is CardioBuzz. Welcome to CardioBuzz, now go to podcast and YouTube channel for all things cardiology. Diseases in general fall into one of two broad categories. Infectious diseases like COVID, tuberculosis, pneumonia, and these usually have a single, direct, straightforward cause. On the other hand, we have chronic diseases like heart diseases, cancers, hypertension, diabetes, etc. And these diseases have multiple risk factors and in some cases multiple causations. So Dr. Hussein, what can be a cause of a disease? The cause of the disease is something that directly leads to the development of the disease and it's impossible to get the disease without it. For example, the famous virus SARS coronavirus 2 is the cause of COVID-19. It's impossible to develop COVID-19 without the virus. So in infectious diseases, it's easy. There's a simple clear agent that causes the disease. On the other hand, atherosclerosis, hypertension, cancer, they don't have a single direct clear cause, but they have several risk factors like smoking, obesity, diabetes, sedentary life, pollution, social stresses, etc. Could you explain more what a risk factors for disease is? A risk factor is something that increases the likelihood that someone will develop a disease, but it does not necessarily cause the disease. For example, obesity is a risk factor for having severe COVID-19 illness, but not all obese will get COVID and may get COVID without being obese. So here, obesity is a risk factor and it's not a cause. Then when do we say a risk factors had a causal effect? When do we promote a risk factors to become a cause? A risk factor can be promoted as a cause, or we can say it has a causal effect on the disease when the disease would never occur in the absence of that risk factor. Okay, how can we reach that conclusion in chronic diseases? We usually gather evidence from more than one method. Good, let's see. Let's assume now that we're trying to find the relation between a substance, we call it X, and a disease, we call it Y, and we need to understand, is substance X a risk factor for the disease Y, or is it a cause for the disease Y? The first method is epidemiology. What is epidemiology? Epidemiology is the study of the distribution and determinants of health or disease in the population. In epidemiology, we use observational studies. So, for example, in our case, we look at a large population and look at those who are more exposed to the substance X. If they get more of disease Y compared to individuals who are less exposed to the same substance X, then substance X becomes a risk factor for a disease. But that alone can establish an association, but does not establish causation, because there might be other factors that are real cause, but we didn't study them carefully. Can you give an example for that? For example, if we compare the death rates in hospitals and in hotels, we find that hospitals have more deaths than hotels. But this is an association, not a causation. People who come to the hospital are more sick, and that sickness is the cause of the mortality, not the hospital itself. So being hospitalized is just a risk factor for dying. It's not the cause of dying. And that shows you how observational studies cannot establish causation. So what other tools do we have to establish causality? We can use biochemistry, animal studies and randomized clinical trials. Okay, how about biochemistry? In biochemistry, we look at the chemical process. So in our case here, if we consistently find the substance X in the tissues with the disease Y, we can believe that the substance X is implicated in the pathology of the disease Y. And if the disease Y never develops in the absence of the substance X, then substance X can be a cause. Good, what else? We can also use animal studies if we give rats the same substance X and they develop more disease Y compared to those rats who are not given the substance X, then here's another clue that substance X can be a cause of the disease. 
Good. What about clinical trials on humans? Yes, we have randomized clinical trials. Clinical trials are experiments in which people are randomly assigned to either receive an intervention, the drug S, or a placebo, which is a fake treatment. And then we follow them and we see who will develop less of the disease Y. If the treatment S reduces the level of the substance X and the chances of the disease Y, then that's another clue the substance X can be a cause of the disease. In fact, clinical trials are the best tools to test the effectiveness of interventions or medications in preventing or treating a disease, but they have to be randomized clinical trials. Why is randomization important? Randomization is key to understand causation. As long as the population has been allocated in a random fashion to receive either the treatment S or the placebo, then any other unseen confounding factor would be assumed equally distributed in both groups, so they cancel each other. Randomization tells us that any difference in outcomes between the treatment group and the placebo group can be attributed only to one factor, which is the drug S, with a higher degree of confidence. Randomization can be done by flipping a coin or through computer programs. When we add blinding of the subjects to their treatment and a big sample size enough to give statistical power, randomized control trials become the gold standard for establishing causal conclusion. Good. It seems that randomized clinical trials bring us close to the truth. We can count on them. Yes, but the sad truth is that in many situations, randomized clinical trials are impossible. For example, we cannot randomize a large group of healthy people to take the potentially harmful substance X versus a placebo and see who will develop more of the disease Y after 20 years. It's unethical and almost impossible. In drug trials, they are vital, but in public health, randomized clinical trials are difficult to do and they are not the way to go. What to do then? We can get help from genetic studies and to be more specific, randomized genetic studies. How do these studies work? Let's start first the basics of genetics. Mendelian inheritance is the way traits or characteristics are passed down from parents to their offsprings. It's named after Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk, who discovered the basic principles of inheritance by studying plants in the 19th century. Mendel found that there are specific units of inheritance that we now call the genes, and these determine the traits like the eye color, the hair texture, the height. Genes come in pairs with one copy inherited from each parent. When parents produce reproductive cells, these cells receive only one copy of each gene. It's a natural but a random process that occurs during the formation of the sperm or the ova. The genes from each parent are mixed together randomly, resulting in a unique combination of traits in each individual. Think of it like shuffling a deck of cards. Each parent has his own deck of genes and during reproduction, these genes are mixed together randomly. Random gene allocation ensures that each child inherits a unique combination of genes from their parents, contributing to the diversity and the complexity of life. And it's essential to the survival of species. How do we use the genetic randomness to identify disease causations? Here come Mendelian randomization trials that combine genetics and epidemiology. Let's try to study the relationship between the factor X and the disease Y. As we might flip a coin in the randomized clinical trial, genes are allocated, as we said, random, like flipping a coin during reproduction. Genes have variations, polymorphisms, which can have different effects on our bodies. And of course, we inherit them before we develop any cancer or atherosclerosis. So if we know that there is a specific genetic polymorphism, I'll call it now G, that helps our bodies to form more of the substance X. Then we study a large population and we find out that those people with more of this polymorphism G compared to the normal gene get more of the disease Y. Then that's another clue that substance X is causal for the disease Y. If I understand correct, Mendelian randomization is a randomized trial not conducted by humans, but conducted by the creation process before we are born and before we get the disease and is unaffected by confounding factors. Exactly, so they can be used to test the effects of long-term exposures like diet, cholesterol, blood sugar, on late health outcomes like heart disease, cancer and diabetes. 
Great. So when we combine positive evidence from observational trials, biochemicals, randomized clinical drug trials, and Mendelian randomization genetic trials, then we come to a conclusion that a substance X is a cause for the disease Y. Yes, exactly. When we see an association in epidemiologic study between substance X and the disease, and when we see the substance X consistently in the pathological process of the disease, and when the drugs that lower the substance X reduce the chances of the disease, and when genetic studies tell us that genes that cause high levels of the substance X are associated with more disease, when all of these evidence are combined, then we conclude that substance X is a cause for the disease Y. But remember, of course, that these methods do not negate the presence of other causes that we might discover in the future. Thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, share the episodes, and if you have a moment, check out some of our previous episodes too. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you never miss out on new content. And see you in coming episode where we discuss how do these methods apply to atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease.